Today, the members of the Science and Security Board move the hands of the Doomsday Clock forward, largely, though not exclusively, because of the mounting dangers in the war in Ukraine. We move the clock forward the closest it has ever been to midnight. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. You just heard the bullets of atomic scientist announce that the doomsday clock is now at 90 seconds to midnight. Dr. Rachel Bronson is the president and CEO of the Bulletin. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plast Race Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Lauren Billet. Welcome back to Press the Button. Hi, Tom. Great to see you as always. Tell me about your weekend. How was it? Lauren, how are you? Great to see you too. I had a nice, quiet weekend. My mother is going to be visiting us next week, so we decided to clean the house. So that's what we did this weekend, but it was very nice. How was yours? That sounds like fun. A nice visit from mom. Mine was nice. Do you know those murder mystery boxes that you can get at like the bookstore? I did one of those this weekend. I love a good mystery and I solved it. Just call me Agatha Christie from now on. But anyways, Tom, what's the latest on the nuclear front? Thanks. On the Ukraine front, the Biden administration last week approved sending U.S. tanks to Kyiv after a drawn-out debate. Uh, As listeners know, Germany had made it quite clear that it would not send its Leopard tanks unless the United States agreed to send tanks as well. So the Pentagon, after initial opposition, will be sending 31 Abrams tanks to Ukraine. They will not come from existing stocks, but will be newly produced, reportedly without depleted uranium armor, which is a classified technology that the Pentagon was worried would fall into Russia's hands. As a result, the U.S. tanks may not arrive for about a year, but this was enough to give political cover to Germany, which has now agreed to send 80 of its tanks to Ukraine on a much faster timeline. Meanwhile, President Zelensky is urging allies to speed up the delivery of weapons before expecting major clashes in the spring. He's also calling for Western fighter planes and long-range missiles. The Biden administration has so far rejected these requests out of concern that the weapons could be used in an assault on Crimea. The Biden administration remains concerned that attacks on Crimea could provoke Russia to escalate the war. On China, a top U.S. Air Force commander says in a leaked memo that odds are, quote, very high that there will be a U.S. military conflict with China in two years. General Michael Minahan, a top Air Force commander, cited Chinese President Xi Jinping's third term and the Taiwan presidential elections in January 2024 as reasons to accelerate troop preparations. General Minahan, who heads the Air Mobility Command, wrote that my gut tells me we will fight in 2025. Podcast listeners will know that there is nothing inevitable about a U.S. war with China, which simulation show would be a disaster for all sides. And for good reason, the Biden administration has recently played down the prospects of military conflict with Beijing. Lastly, Iran and Russia, both struggling under Western sanctions, have connected their interbank communications to help boost trade and financial transactions. Since the 2018 re-imposition of U.S. sanctions on Iran, the Islamic Republic has been disconnected from the Belgian-based SWIFT financial messaging system, which is a key to international banking. And similar limitations have been placed on some Russian banks since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine last year. Lauren, what do you have lined up for early warning? This week on Early Warning, Angela Kellett sat down with Lily Adams, the Senior Outreach Coordinator at the Union of Concerned Scientists. They discussed the latest reports that officers who worked at a nuclear missile base in Montana have been diagnosed with blood cancer and how their service may have contributed to their illness and how this is unfortunately not the only case of nuclear weapons posing negative harmful physical impacts on people. And then I talk with Dr. Rachel Bronson, president and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. We discuss the doomsday clock, which is now set at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest it has ever been. Why is the clock so close to doomsday and how do we step back from the brink? Stay tuned. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback helps us to improve the show. And with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning, early warning, early warning, early warning. 
a 7-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Jacqueline. The U.S. military is looking into unusual blood cancer cases among officers who previously managed nuclear missile silos at a base in Montana, an Air Force official said following the release of a new report. The Associated Press reported that nine military officers who worked at Maelstrom Air Force Base as missileers, troops tasked with standing by in an underground bunker to fire mi- nuclear missiles, have been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at ages noticeably younger than the median age for this disease and the military is investigating if there is a connection between their respective services at the facility, some of which stretch back decades, and the disease. We often discuss how dangerous nuclear weapons are and what would happen if they were used. It's important to also discuss the dangers these weapons pose to the communities where they are tested and stored, and to the workers at the nuclear weapons facilities. Today we are joined by Lily Adams. She is a Senior Outreach Coordinator at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Lily, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. We are often told that nuclear weapons keep us safe, that it's only when they are used that they pose a danger. Do nuclear weapons actively harm people today? Thanks. Yeah, I think, you know, this story points to a larger issue that is often really lost in the political debates around nuclear weapons. And you, you know, alluded to this, that even without ever being used in conflict or since 1945, nuclear weapons have and still do hurt and even kill U.S. communities uh, and those abroad through things like those health and environmental harms. So this case in Montana could be another example of that. I do want to be clear that, you know, so far there's not really enough information to know if these missile silos are definitely linked to these cancers or not. It's also not clear from the articles if that link would be from radiation or from other toxins. But regardless, Obviously, the military is concerned enough that they're very seriously looking into this. And I think that's great because this wouldn't be the first time that, you know, people's military service was linked to illnesses. Many veterans experience this, especially when their military service involves nuclear weapons. And so often they aren't given the resources and support that they would need to then battle those illnesses. There was the one of the articles that came out from Business Insider. They mentioned another group of veterans who were sent to clean up incredibly radioactive waste in the Marshall Islands, where we tested 67 of our nuclear weapons. And they were exposed to plutonium, other radionuclides, other toxins. But they had to fight for decades to even be recognized as exposed. They were constantly denied by the government and by the military. And it's only just last year that they were recognized. One of the veterans I work with a lot is Ken Brunel, and he lives in upstate New York, but was stationed in Enoe Takatol in the Marshall Islands. And he's also had blood cancer. And, you know, it was only just last year that he was finally recognized for his illness. And so this is what the PACT Act was addressing last year. That was a hugely important bill makes it easier for veterans to get care and support for these kinds of illnesses related to toxic exposures during their service. And I'm glad to see more attention on this. I think, you know, this case in Montana is a good example of, you know, the kind of attention we should put to this. But as you said, it's also not just in the military. Civilians are also impacted by this. So downwinders of nuclear tests, uranium workers, production workers and production site downwinders, many thousands and thousands of people who in many cases are still fighting for recognition and support. You mentioned this too in the article, sometimes this exposure could be decades ago, but these cancers can take decades to appear. That being said, this also includes current and future workers and downwinders. So even today at nuclear facilities, there is a lot of talk and a lot of work right now to expand nuclear weapons production, and that could have these same kinds of effects that we're seeing. So yeah, you know, we're told that nuclear weapons keep the peace, that they protect us. But in fact, these weapons are killing the very people they're supposed to protect. So, you know, no American has been killed by an enemy's nuclear weapons, but tens of thousands of people have been killed by the U.S.'s own nuclear weapons through these kinds of health and environmental harms. So you've touched on this. So how has the government responded to other cases where nuclear weapons have had a negative physical impact on people? like in the cases of uranium workers, downwinders, and cleanup veterans, all of whom have had negative impacts by nuclear weapons. And is there a disparity here in the response? Yes, I do see a disparity. And this wasn't really addressed in the articles that have come out. But, you know, every step of this process, from producing, testing, dealing with the waste from these weapons, harms people's health and can result in 
these cancers, like what they're seeing in Montana. So there's a woman that I worked with over the last couple of years from Montana. Her name's Isla Nation. And in addition to being the home of many of these missile silos, Montana was also one of the states most exposed to radioactive fallout from nuclear weapons testing uh, in Nevada. So she and her family, though growing up, they had no idea of the risks, um, but she began getting sick at a very young age and she got thyroid cancer um, in, in her teens and has had many other illnesses related uh, to that exposure. But you know, her family and she never got that same kind of attention that these missileers are seeing today and efforts to learn more about these kinds of civilian downward exposures and other exposures have been very fraught. So, you know, since the beginning of the nuclear age, you know, we've seen that the risks have often been downplayed by the government studies about those risks and the results from those studies have sometimes been suppressed or hidden both from the public and from victims, even from Congress. Sometimes there have just been no studies at all. So these civilian communities are often in this like David and Goliath kind of battle trying to abdicate just for information and for their own health. There was this one line in the AP article that really stuck out to me where someone said all missileers should be screened and tracked for the rest of their lives. And, you know, absolutely. I think that's a very good idea. Um, but where was that kind of concern and diligence for these civilian victims? You know, and I want to be clear, like, it is only a good thing that the military is taking this potential link very seriously. And I really applaud the urgency and the gravity that they're giving this issue. But surely that same level of concern should also be afforded to these other communities. Um, and, you know, especially in the case of civilians, these people were exposed without their consent. They never enlisted to fight for their country. Um, but now they are having to fight for their health and their lives. So they were harmed in the name of national security, and they still carry that burden today. So the government and the military should put just as much effort into their health and safety as for these missileers in Montana. So has there been legislation put in place to adequately address these issues? In some cases, yes. In other cases, no. And sort of everything in between. <laughs> so I mentioned the PACT Act earlier. This was really sweeping, you know, historic legislation actually to address veterans' toxic exposure. And that was, you know, amazing to see all the veterans who fought for that. And, you know, very glad to see Congress finally pass that last year. There's also a longstanding program since 2000 that is for nuclear workers who built the weapons or worked in our nuclear labs. They are eligible for compensation and health benefits due to their exposure. But then you look at a program like the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, or RECA. That program has been in place since 1990. It's meant to cover downwinders and uranium workers but the compensation is very limited. It provides no health benefits and it's always excluded many communities. For example, the community surrounding the first ever nuclear weapons test in New Mexico. And then for other groups, for example, those who lived near or continue to live near nuclear facilities and labs, there's no form of compensation or benefits available at all. And actually very little work to you know, study, further study and address those risks. So we have sort of this patchwork of different kinds of policies with some gaping holes. And, you know, for all of these programs, even the ones that work pretty well and do exist, it took decades for those programs to be established after lots and lots of very diligent advocacy from the communities who were harmed. And then now applying and trying to, you know, improve those programs is very bureaucratic, very challenging. Um, especially actually for veterans. I have heard stories of veterans who have waited decades for their claims to be approved. And when that's happening, that means that people are dying while they're waiting for compensation. So I think, you know, there's a lot of work to be done still to make these policies strong enough to actually address these issues. And then I think, you know, when we're talking about policy, we also need to look at the cost of nuclear weapons and what we're spending, you know, we're on track to spend over a trillion dollars over the next 30 years on our nuclear weapons. But that does not factor in this human cost, which is so much harder to quantify. But I think it's extremely unjust to continue pouring money into these weapons while we're leaving the communities they've harmed high and dry. You know, when it's budget season, it always seems like there's enough money for nuclear weapons, plenty of money to go around. But when it comes time to actually take care of people who are suffering, suddenly those costs are too high. Lily, where can listeners go to learn more about this? 
especially for the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which is a really active you know, legislative issue right now. There's a website called expandrica.org that has more information about the individuals who are impacted and about efforts and bills to expand and strengthen those programs. So that's a great resource. Lily, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Shing, the Communications and Marketing Specialist at Plowshares Fund. We work tirelessly to reduce and eventually eliminate the dangers posed by nuclear weapons. And we're able to do this because of the generosity of supporters and listeners like you. 100% of your tax-deductible gift will be used to support the smartest people with the best ideas. Go to plowshares.org slash donate today. And thanks for listening. Last week, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the hands of its iconic doomsday clock up 10 seconds. It is now 90 seconds to midnight, the closest the clock has ever been to global catastrophe. The doomsday clock is meant to warn the public about the dangers of our own technologies that threaten to destroy the world, and it's a metaphor for the perils that threaten global security. According to the Bulletin, the growing dangers posed by the war in Ukraine prompted the clock to be moved from 100 seconds to 90 seconds. The clock reflects other dangers as well, including pandemic threats, disinformation, and climate change. Today we're joined by Dr. Rachel Bronson, President and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Rachel, great to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So Rachel, let's start with the symbolism of the doomsday clock. The clock is internationally recognized it draws incredible media attention each year, and it has been called by its admirers the closest thing the arms control community has to a brand. So what is it about the clock, in your view, that makes it so successful in capturing public attention? There's really several answers to your question. The first, and probably the reason it's so powerful, is it was created by an artist who understood the science. Right? It was created by Marta Langsdorff, the wife of a Manhattan Project scientist. So she really understood the urgency, the despair, the fear, the optimism of what was possible politically if we all focused on kind of key issues at the time of nuclear annihilation. And she really understood that to her core. It was her husband who was working on it, but she was an artist. So she was able to create something that connected with the public. She could do what the scientists couldn't. She could connect to the public. And that in and of itself, I think, is the seeds for explaining why it is so powerful. It's not just one community, just the scientists, or just the scientists and the academics, but connected with the arts and the focus on engaging the public. It was designed to engage the public. So I'd say that's the first thing. The second is that it has some gravitas in terms of how it's set. It's changed over the years. It's 76 years old at this point, but it was set by people who are really close to the issues that they were measuring, if you will, if they were talking about. It was set by the editor of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, Eugene Rabinowitz, who moved around. He was, you know, he moved around the scientists of the day. He was engaged. People who were helping him think through these issues later were at Pugwash and back. They were really in the mix of it. They were engaging with Fermi and Einstein and Oppenheimer. So there's some credibility and there's, there's real credibility to this. Uh, and that continues to be the case. Then I think the fact that it's 76 years old, there's very few things that we can say, you know, how does this compare and have serious questions and what's changed and what's the same that makes it so important and powerful. That's really kind of key to this. And then lastly, I would say in the design, it transcends languages. You know, we do get a critique from time to time, well, like kids today can't read an analog clock, but it transcends languages. If you're looking at it in Russia or China or Japan or Nairobi, you know, wherever you are um, sitting there in Amman, Jordan, you are understanding this the same way. You can see it. And I think that has a real power too, that it's not language dependent. So all of those roll up into making this a pretty powerful metaphor and iconic image. 
Agreed. And I think the, the graphic nature of it, as you just described, lends to a very simple message, right? I think we're, mm-hmm. we're all overwhelmed by information overload. And this graphic kind of cuts through all that and just provides a very simple message that I think everyone can understand. It's mm-hmm. really quite impressive. But I do need to ask, because of course, as you know, the clock has also been derided as an oversimplified publicity stunt with the goal of scaring people into action. How would you respond to that? So first of all, just picking up on what you said, you know, and its power is that it's crude. It's a crude symbol, right? And so in some ways, we can be criticized for being too complicated or too simplistic. The topics that we're addressing are so complicated, Tom. You know this. You spend your life, you know, working in it and, you know, your listeners as well. If we just limit ourselves to nuclear issues, those issues are themselves complicated and they're almost designed to keep the public out, right? Like you can't understand this because you're not a nuclear physicist. You can't understand this because you haven't been assistant secretary of state for issues around disarmament. And so it is simplistic, but what we're doing is when we gather our science and security board together, they're talking throughout the year, but especially in November when they come together, we're saying like, hey, we get it, really complicated stuff. But tell us, is humanity safer or greater risk this year compared to last year? And when they're like, well, you can't just answer yes or no, like the public's kind of craving that with all this information and all of this, they're craving just an answer. And so we kind of, the clock is them to say, Yes, it's more dangerous. No, it's not. Or it's about the same. But here's things that we're worried about. And here's things we're optimistic about. And so in that, I think it's very important. The audience, people often ask, like, who's the audience? And the audience for the clock really is the general public. Tom, you don't need a lot of your listeners. They don't need the clock to tell them that it's more dangerous. But there's a lot of people out there. And this is where like the fear critique I'm not really sure always what to do with that because, and I'll circle back, but like we want to acknowledge it's called the doomsday clock. It does scare people. And we take that very, very seriously because that's not really what we're just trying to terrorize people. But what I think that the clock can do, and we hear this from a lot of the comments we got, is actually connect with people who think things aren't going particularly well. It is hard to look at 2022 and say, things got better. (laughs) And especially in the issues that we focused on man-made threats to human existence. And so what this clock time, and again, we get comments on it is people are like, thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that things don't seem to be going in the right direction. And I'm not crazy. And I'm not alone. And so that critique is it's scaring people. We do our best to add transparency. It's another reason we publish the statement. We publish the statement every year. And we're, we try to make that very clear in our announcement that if do you want to know more, do you want to know why we set the clock the way we did? This is a judgment among experts who work on these issues every day. And here's a glimpse into you know, it's usually like somewhere around 12 pages. It's shorter this year. Here's why we set it the way we do. And we do that so that people can engage with it. They can disagree. They can agree. They can go deeper if they want to. And that also is an effort to try to demystify it a little bit. And also, if you are scared by this, be like, what are they talking about? But Tom, I think you would agree. These are pretty dangerous times. And uh, we don't want to sugarcoat that either because people are looking to us to give our evaluation on it. And we do think that it's a pretty dangerous moment. Could not agree more. We had a little office pool about which way the clock was going to move and (laughs) and definitely agree that, you know, we we could quibble about how many seconds, but definitely agree that that moving, moving closer to midnight was the way it should go, unfortunately. But let's shift to the substance of it now. There were some key factors behind moving the clock closer to midnight. So give us your sense of what those key factors were. So we tried to be really clear in our announcement. And I think this really was what drove the discussion from the very beginning. People felt very strongly about this, which is the war in Ukraine comes so dangerous because of 
the real destruction of an international order around cooperation between the United States and Russia, but also with other countries as well. Because the US and Russia had such a difficult history, not an easy, but a history of, of really trying to resolve conflicts together, often on the other sides of it, they often did succeed, but you know, kind of a golden era, if you will, of arms control between 1970 and 2010, if you had a bookmark it, the complete destruction of, of areas of cooperation, particularly in the nuclear sphere, but not limited to, was so devastating to members of our science and security board in all aspects that they look at, that we really needed to call that out. For those who have been following our statements for years now, we have really since 2010, the last time we moved it back away from midnight, we've been calling out a real deterioration in US-Russia relations, which is so devastating, right? Two countries that control 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. And so we've been talking about that deterioration. This year, when the Science and Security Board came together and assessed the year, it was really like the destruction of that, right? Any last fibers that were keeping it together have been rendered. Um, that's the part that was really of greatest concern. And then you see the implications of that in the other spaces. And we talk about a decrease in cooperation at, you know, around kind of, uh, of transparency and regulation around bio threats. And exactly when you need that kind of cooperation because new threats are on the horizon and a moment where we could be making positive progress, the ingredients to do so are, have just been blown away. We talk about the norms of the environments in which we're familiar, you know, the fact that you could look at the nuclear power plant in Ukraine, Zaporizhia, and, and look at that and see the Russians basically turned it into a, a terrifying radioactive landmine right, is so unconscionable and so unimaginable. And the use of nuclear threats by an invading P5 power, the Russians invading into Ukraine, using nuclear threats as a possible instrument of the war to come is so shocking that we had to acknowledge that. And so it was really those kinds of actions. And you'll see in our statement, right, we talk about the fact of the implications for climate change have been really detrimental as countries try to move very quickly, not over time, but very quick to reduce their reliance on Russian gas and oil and what that means in terms of not investing as they could have in renewables, but other fossil fuels that have long tails. And the biospace we really called out because we are worried about the lack of ability to create the kind of regimes that the nuclear community could lead on to offer lessons, those are shattered. So it was a pretty bleak conversation when we were kind of talking through this. We know we talk about a corrupted information space and how it makes it so much harder to address these changes, but we wanted to really focus the attention on Ukraine and what the global consequences of that particular area of conflict, the implications of that for so many other things that we need to be worried about and focus on and build on and engage on. We did think it was notably worse and therefore did move it closer to midnight for that reason. On Ukraine, how worried are you about the use of nuclear weapons in this conflict? And do you think that that risk is rising or falling? It's a great question and one, you know, that we really kind of talk through in our discussions. And so we wanted to be clear that the risk was higher than anyone thought it could have been, you know, before, I was going to say a year ago, but we're coming right up on that. The risk is greater than it had been. And I think that there was, you know, real concern in March and April because we didn't know, we couldn't believe that you know, the president of Russia would say the things that he did. We couldn't imagine that he would handle the power plant the way he did, that there was so much that was shocking that the level really did rise. 
So we came together in March and issued a statement and we considered whether to move the clock then. You know, we tried to wait for the year and assess where we've been and not respond to immediate events. But, you know, what was happening was happening so quickly with such profound implications. And so, as you'll recall, we didn't see the kind of activity that we would expect to see from the Russians if they actually were going to use their nuclear weapons. They seemed to be kind of testing out some possible rhetoric that would lend to a false flag operation. So we were genuinely concerned. I think there is reason over the course of the year to begin to believe that while it was still much more dangerous than it had been, maybe it wasn't quite as dangerous as the height, you know, where we were in March and April. And it was so interesting, Tom, as we were kind of really talking through this and what did it mean and what should it mean for the clock, that right as we were kind of talking through some of this, if I'm, if I'm getting the timeline right, if this wasn't the example, there's a similar one. It was right about that time when the missile kind of fell into Poland and whose missile was that and what would the retaliation be and who did it. And it reminded us all like, how quickly things can change and how precarious truly this situation is that without all of the kinds of institutions and norms that any day you can wake up and it's spiraled into a much more dangerous situation. That's what we kind of meant by a hundred seconds. You know, when we moved it to a hundred seconds, we kind of pointed out some worrisome places to focus. And one of them was Ukraine. And when we came out and, and issued our statement in March, we said, this is what 100 seconds feels like. But if there was any kind of thinking among some that like, oh, maybe we don't have to move it for Russia, those kinds of reminders of just how dangerous this all is because of really our concerns around accidents and misperceptions. And we know that's how wars spread, right? We know that's how things change very quickly when you have this broken architecture and then there's misperceptions. So we do think it's dangerous. Um, we do think that the year 2022, there was some parts where it was even more dangerous, but there was enough for us to really look at that and say, it really had to move closer to midnight. And then thinking through kind of what seconds mean and what time would reflect our concern and the kinds of deep conversations we have about, well, how far do we move the clock and why? It's why we moved it. We never expected to move it closer than 100 seconds, never wanted to, certainly. But we really felt we had to do, given the year that we lived through and the situation which we find ourselves in. Yeah, and it certainly has been quite a year, that's for sure. Now, has the war in Ukraine affected other issues that you're tracking, say, climate change? So we lay that out in the report. As we talk through where were the bright spots, and so we do point out some bright spots around climate change, where coming out of the kind of UN meeting on climate COP, there were some bright spots, and that was kind of the recognition of the smaller states and helping them respond, and final movement by some of the big emitters about recognizing the responsibilities, you know, their responsibilities and the consequences. And so we try to call that out to say there's possibilities here, but it wasn't fast enough. It wasn't enough. Climate's really tricky for us because it's such a slow moving crisis, even though it, it feels to be speeding up now, but still it's tricky. And so we did point out those bright spots and we've done that over the course of the past few years when we've talked about some bright spots around climate that political parties throughout the world are beginning to put climate change onto their platforms. You see mobilization globally around particularly young people, but that is really infiltrating business decisions and others in ways that you didn't see five, 10 years ago. So they're bright spots, but we are very worried about how quickly countries move to reduce their reliance on Russian fossil fuels and how, because of that kind of quick nature of it and how they invested, they're just laying the infrastructure for long-term continued consumption of fossil fuels in a way that doesn't meet with the targets that we are trying to achieve to reduce the effects of climate. The consequences of Ukraine and the kind of quick transition to other sources of fossil fuels 
without the kinds of investments we would have wanted and hope would have hoped to have seen in other renewables has been really dispiriting. That's a big piece. I think, you know, it really bears watching what's happening in the debate around nuclear power in Europe and elsewhere. It's a set of issues that the bulletin has long grappled with, right? The role of nuclear power, especially because it's never going to be a silver bullet. There's no silver bullets, but in a space where we're trying to find all sources of energy generation that reduce our carbon footprint, nuclear power is one that we would want to see in the mix. However, you can't have nuclear power without arms control and cooperation between the United States and Russia and understanding of what's going on inside the laboratories and what's going on inside the power plants and, and what's going on you know, in terms of the nuclear power and the safety required to ensure that it remains safe. And all of those which really demand U.S.-Russian cooperation to get us there, we don't see a future for that right now. And so even that is really influenced by, even though you're seeing countries moving towards, you know, considering, oh, maybe one of the lessons is nuclear power, there needs to be arms control associated with that. One of our science and security boards says you can't trade one existential threat for another. And the way these two issues come together is if you want nuclear power, you have to have arms control. And you have to have transparency and verification. And that seems so lost right now. So that's on the climate space. And then we do speak a lot about the biospace. The bulletin has been doing a lot of work, right? We think about man-made threats. And we've long kind of been really attentive to what's happening in laboratories back in the day in the Cold War is because we were interested in bioweapons and we still are. But what we're really concerned about in terms of labs is just technology is moving so quickly. And more and more countries have access to it, but it's not clear that, again, the institutions, the norms, the regulations, the transparency, all that we would need to believe that, you know, we're, that this is being managed well. And go back to our founder, you know, Einstein, everything's changed except the way that we think about it. That is like the moment we're in in, in, the, in the natural sciences. This is back when we were founded, it was the physical sciences and, you know, it's kind of moved through and we're really in this kind of bioscience era. And yet we have none of the institutions in place to build on the lessons that the nuclear community could have been providing of how we keep up with these issues in terms of arms control. How do we verify what's transparency look like? What kinds of monitors do you need? You know, it's all shot up by what we're seeing now. So at this moment where we really do need to focus on 21st century threats and not 20th century threats. We can't do that. We've just been set back. Like the clock has been you know, moved towards midnight rather than away from midnight. And we need it moving in the other direction to handle the newer challenges of the 21st century. So that's how we kind of fold in these other issues. They connect in different ways. And you know, not everyone it seems to know, you know, like kind of more general public, but the bulletin works on these issues every day. And your organization works on these issues every day. And People are working on these issues every day. So what we hope is that if we get your attention with the clock, that you might actually take a little time and read the statement, or you'll follow up on some of those groups that we previewed in the Roland video or on our site. And then if that's interesting, you'll follow them and to stay engaged and informed and become kind of an advocate and ambassador in your community about why these issues matter, not just what time it is, but why they matter. And if the clock can serve as a way for you to start that conversation, I think there's a lot of evidence that it does serve that role. You know, that's something we can offer people when they're ambassadors in their own communities. That's a great segue into my next and last question, which is that, okay, we're, we're closer to midnight than ever before, but what can we do to back away from the brink? And what are some of the most important steps we can take? I think often of last year in our clock announcement, we had science communicator, Hank Green, and he said better than I'll say, so I'm just paraphrasing it. You can see why he's the communicator in this. But he said, you know, no one person can fix this all, but we need everyone to do something to make us safer, right? It's like one person can't do everything, but we need everyone to do something. And so, and, and you hear that from great communicators, Catherine Hale in the climate space talks about this, like, Everybody is a leader in their community somewhere. 
It can be on the playground when you're picking your kids up after school. It can be think tanks. It can be in your place of worship. Everybody has some people they interact with and engaging on the topic of, is this the world that we want to leave to our children? And if not, what can we do about it? And how do we do about it? So if you're in the United States, and Tom, this will be really familiar to you, right? We're about to spend $1.3, $1.8 trillion over the next 30 years on modernizing our nuclear arsenal. Even if you believe that mutually assured destruction has kept us safe, even if you do believe that abolition isn't the right answer, but we can still get to reduction. And if you believe abolition and getting rid of all nuclear weapons is the right answer, like both those camps can agree, we can certainly reduce the numbers that we have, and we can certainly reduce the investments that we're making rather than creating the nuclear arsenal 2.0. And so this notion, you know, if you're seeing in the United States around nuclear weapons, your focus on nuclear weapons, like having this conversation of, do we really need to be spending between one and $2 trillion over the next 30 years? And at what cost, right? When we look, we say, well, we can't really invest in what we need to for pandemic preparedness. Like where's the money coming from? Well, we've made choices and we are making choices and we'll continue to make choices that we don't have money for that because we're investing in other places. And one of those big places is in our nuclear arsenal, right? So where does that money go? If, if you're interested in climate change, right, that there's more kind of at the grassroots and more groups engaged in this. And so where in your community, again, you're not going to change global admissions, but we can all do this together and begin bringing down where can you influence, where can you make a difference at the local or national level. So it's really what we're asking is, what do you care about and finding ways to get engaged. And what we try to do, the bulletin with this again, is to lay out all the different groups. And so there's not one thing anyone can do, but I think there's something that everyone can do, or maybe even Hank would say it better. There is probably one thing that everyone can do, but we just have to figure out what is that one thing that we can do and not everyone's going to be able to do the same thing. But actually action can be the best antidote to feeling kind of a despair of where all this is going. And the more engaged you can get on these issues, often that can have a positive feedback as well. Rachel could, could not agree more. That's a great place to end it. I want to thank you so much for a fantastic conversation. And best of luck in all your work. Thank you, Tom. Really, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Lauren Billet, Angela Kellett, and Alex Hall. Audio engineering in San Francisco by Jacqueline Shing. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.